guys, what's up? Welcome back to another episode of Hospitality TV. Uh, this is part two here at SOMCOM uh, in San Diego. We are with Eric Siegelbaum, the founder of Sommelier. How are you doing today, sir? I am doing great. <laughs> thanks, for having, thanks for taking the time. Yeah, of course. Thanks um, for having me. It's been kind of a crazy day. We've been running around all day. Um, this is part two, kind of a little series that we're doing. I had the chance to interview Haley Moore this morning. We're doing how to win at beverage programs. So she was talking, or she was part of the panel that was talking about expenses. You were um, moderating both of these panels, mm -hmm. right? The second part was revenue, so I kind of want to do that with you today. Sure. Um, but real I like quickly, money. Yeah. <laughs> then we all. Um, we're going to talk about some real specifics here that, as I said in the other podcast, I think are really some of the things that are getting missed the most with most sommeliers. I'm sure you, you know. Um, and I think that I'm honestly, this is one of the subjects that I've been most excited about within this whole conference because it's what more people need to learn about. Um, I was incredibly impressed with what you did in uh, SOMCON DC, which is where this whole idea came from. I know we've been chatting back and forth, so I'm pumped that we got to do this now. Me too. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a long time coming. So uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself quickly and then we'll get into some of these topics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am in my 16th year as a sommelier and uh, 26 year in the restaurant business, or I should say in the industry since uh, now that I'm a consultant, my second least favorite C word. No, 26, real quick, you're young, man. Like, when did you get into the business? 13, first kitchen Dang. job. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, um, so 10 years of chef, 16 years of sommelier. Uh, my most recent experience set before starting my company, sommelier, was uh, as the corporate beverage director for Steven Star Restaurants. So over the course of my five and a half years with them, uh, by the time I left, I was overseeing more than $100 million of revenue for 40 completely different restaurants. I opened 17 restaurants with them. Crazy. Uh, in all sorts of cities, con you know, 22 of them in Philadelphia, which is control state buying. Uh, in New York, which is a different type of buying. In Florida, which is a different type of buying. We had one in Paris, so that was fun. Got to practice my oh, French. That's awesome. <laughs> um, prior to that, I, I spent a year as the head sommelier of a ship called The World. And if you don't know The World, take five minutes and look it up. Uh, go down that internet rabbit hole. <laughs> but the short story is, it's the size of a 2,000 passenger cruise ship. And in that same space, there are 165 apartments. Everyone is privately owned. It's not a rental or a timeshare or anything. You own, as an owner, you buy your apartment and an equity percentage of the ship and an equity percentage of the staff of the ship, the staffing company. Yeah. And it's basically um, ultimate luxury. It's been circumnavigating the globe since 2002 and the best of the best. So um, basically I was the head sommelier of the world. That was my actual title, head sommelier of the world, which was pretty cool uh, for a year. And basically um, just making sure 1% of the 1% had really great wines. Oh my God, uh, that's so a fun job. It, it was incredible. No In, budget. No budget. Um, I purchased over a million dollars of wine um, just from one Bordeaux negotiant once, um, I got to call and be like, call Lafitte and tell them I need two cases of 61 and five cases of 85 and 10 cases of 90 and 20 oh cases of 95. And then be like, okay, yeah, they'll send them. Uh, it was, it was wild. Um, but in my two contracts of four months each on that ship in that one year, I was able to experience more first growth or equivalent Bordeaux, uh, Grand Cru Burgundy, Grand Marc Champagne, like in, then my entire aggregated career. So in terms of the value of that, mm -hmm. pick a vintage of Lynch Bosch, I've had everyone back to 54 because of that ship. And That's I had insane. them side by side, which was like educationally insane. mind blowing. Um, so yeah, so I've had a good life. Uh, before that I was the corporate wine director for Schwartz Brothers Restaurants okay. up in Seattle overseeing uh, five different restaurants and three different concepts, so. That's crazy, yeah, you've seen a ton of different markets. I mean, pretty much almost all yep. there is. <laughs> yep. Lots of markets, lots of buyers, lots of buying styles, lots of buying rules, lots yep. of sommeliers that I've worked with for and above and under. So, uh, so in all those markets, all those places that you worked for, yeah. um, I mean, why do people need to know this stuff? I think sommeliers fundamentally misunderstand their jobs. In fact, uh, you know, no disrespect, my fellow Psalms, most of us, I'm, I'm a sommelier, so I'm going to say us, most sommeliers suck at their jobs, and it's not because of any reason other than most sommeliers don't understand what their job truly is. We tend to think as an industry that our job is, I love wine, so I study wine, I talk about wine, and I sell wine. And the reality is that is not the job of a sommelier. That is the fun thing you get to do at the very end when everything else is done. Our jobs as sommeliers are to operate, occasionally build, but always operate an efficient, well-organized, financially sound. And when I say financially sound, I don't just mean profitable. Yes, profit's important. Uh, but a program that drives revenue, that understands revenue and sales tactics, that has controlled cost of goods with an understanding of blended cost of goods, contribution margin, time value of money, um, you know, all of these things with a well-organized seller, with perfect physical and digital collateral, free of 86s, vintage errors, spelling errors, where the, no, the, the naming conventions are the same. So on one line, it's not producer first and then cuvee, and the next line, it's great first and then producer, with the same fonts that are, that are well well justified, then 
a well-trained staff because I don't, unless you have a team of eight and a restaurant with 10 seats, no someone that can impact every guest decision. So you need your staff to understand not every wine on your list, no, but the ethos of the program, mm -hmm. how to navigate the list, how to guide guests through it. Right. When all of that is done and all of your invoices are coded and verified that what what you ordered is actually what you got and there aren't vintage changes you didn't know about and the prices are correct and, and all of your emails answered and all of that. When all of that is done, then and only then is the sommelier's job, study wine, talk about wine, sell mm -hmm. wine. And so if you don't have an understanding of the fundamentals of the business of wine and the understanding of the fundamentals of the factors that affect revenue and the factors that, expect, that affect cost and the factors that affect and impact the gross profitability of your operation and potentially yourself if you are commissioned or bonused or anything like that, then you fundamentally don't know what you're doing really because that is what your true job is. And also a lot of people forget it's not your money. So you're playing with other people's money. Sometimes millions and millions of dollars are other people's money and you owe it to your owners, your investors, uh, your partners, whoever it is, unless you're a one person operation where you are the owner and the sommelier and the server and the manager and that's it, you owe it to them to be responsible with that money and you owe it to them to know how to use it properly for the benefit of A, your guests, right. uh, and B, your operation. Right, so let's talk about a couple of those things that you mentioned. Um, let's start backwards. So one of the last things you said was training, right? Um, what, are, what have been some successful training tactics that you've used or seen for in order to increase revenue, right? Because I feel sometimes like you can have, and I've been totally guilty of it, you can have really cool, passionate training sessions with your staff. And you know, we, what we do a lot of too is, for example, at our restaurant, I know you're part of the CMS program also, we, we're, here, we're here to mentor and make sure they have tasting groups and they're exposed to other people who are better tasters than they are and all these things. Looking back, sometimes I feel like I don't know if, how much is that really helping to increase revenue to this restaurant, right? And, you, and as busy as we are, we also wanna make sure that we're using our time in the right place. Are there sales, excuse me, are there um, educational, is there an educational approach that can be a little bit more tailored to have an outcome on the revenue side of the restaurant? Oh, absolutely, 100%. Um, first of all, you have to know your customer. When you're training your servers and your bartenders and your sommelier team, and they're your customers, so to speak. I, I, a person that comes to my restaurant and spends money is a guest. But a person that is working with me when I'm training them is a customer. Mm -hmm. Right? because they're making money based on what we're talking about and if and how I can help them. And if they're making money, my restaurant's making money. Right. So understand that we might be passionate and excited about wine, and for most people, they're not career servers or bartenders. And even if they are, most people don't really care so much about wine. Maybe some of them recognize that it's a means to an end, but we can't expect them to get excited about subregions and soil types and months in oak and all that stuff that we might care about and think is important. And I think most people get training wrong because they train something like this. I know a lot about this stuff. I'm going to tell you about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Know your customer. Your training should be, I'm going to teach you how to use this information to increase your check average and increase your tip percentage and increase your, increase your guest satisfaction. Mm -hmm. That's for them, but the ancillary benefit is it's for your restaurant right. profitability. The other part of that is most people train wrong. And you know, again, not to call anyone out, mm -hmm. but even like at the master of wine, master sommelier level, and all points in between winemakers, importers, distributors, 99% of the people who I've ever heard train are doing it wrong. Not that they're not knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. It's because most people train on what? Training is about how and why. And I will give you a perfect example. When uh, the last restaurant I opened for Star Restaurants was St. Ansem in DC. And I decided based on the history and relevance of Madeira to DC and my love of Madeira that I was going to try to build one of the best Madeira programs in the country. And I don't mean biggest, I just mean most exciting. Mm -hmm. So we opened that restaurant with over 50 different Madeiras. They were all available by the ounce rather than a three ounce glass. So they're, they're more cost appropriate. Uh, organized by style, not necessarily by grape or sweetness level. Um, and St. Ansem's training, when we opened, I spent about two hours training the staff on Madeira. I spent about eight minutes explaining what is Madeira, what are the rules, what are the grapes, what are the styles. And I spent the remaining nearly hour and 45 minutes or hour and 50 minutes explaining how and why. 
Why do we have this program? How is it relevant to DC? How is it relevant to the cuisine? How do you pair with the cuisine? Why does Cercial go so well with oysters and charcuterie and things like that? Why does Bual go so well with fattier fish and, uh, and, and steaks and lamb? And why does um, Verdejo go so well with anything fried and more white lean fish? And, and, why, and how is it that really Madeira is not really a dessert wine, even at its sweetest, it barely qualifies. Mm -hmm. How do you work that into the conversation? Why would a guest be excited about this? How do you, how do you take this scary unknown thing and, and, and introduce them to a, an inexpensive flight that then unlocks it to them? So St. Anson sells like two to $3,000 a week of Madeira, not because people are coming in and, demand, and being like, I want some 1850 Circeal. It's there, sure, you can buy it, but that's not why. And it's not because the staff even knows so much about what Madeira is beyond the, you know, the perfunctory understanding of it. Mm -hmm. It's because they understand how and why. And that's what all training should be. So many sommeliers will, in a lineup, pour a taste for everyone that's in the room, maybe distribute a tech sheet and be like, this wine is from this region and it's this subregion and this family's been around for this long and this is how long in oak and this is the soil. Okay, taste the wine, here's the flavor profile, go sell it, it's, it's $139 a bottle. That's useless training. Guests don't care about that. Servers aren't gonna remember that. You need to explain how to talk to a guest about it. How in three words to describe it. Like, I, my training is about taking the most complicated things and making them simple. Mm -hmm. Like, I can, in 30 seconds, 30 seconds, I can teach servers to fully understand Burgundy in, an, in enough of a way that they can use it to guide a guest through a list if the list is regionally organized. Mm -hmm. I can explain in 10 words the 10 crews of Beaujolais in terms of how a guest could describe them descriptively, or sorry, how a server or a bartender could describe them descriptively to a guest to be to understand what's the difference between Morgan, Brewery, Shina, right? That is what effective training is. It's not what are the crews. It's right. how do you, if you have four or five crews of Beaujolais in your program, how do you help your servers understand what the difference is? Because you know what a guest is gonna ask? Not, um, what what is a gamay? It's a crossing of which two grapes again? They're not going to ask you that. They're not going to be like, what are the crews? They're just going to be like, well, what's the difference? Mm -hmm. And if you can't answer that, the di the only point of differentiation is going to be the price point. And that's not a good way to generate revenue. Right. But if your if your people can understand how to talk about the concept, whatever it is, Burgundy, Madeira, Israeli wine. Uh, Northern California wine, um, orange wine, whatever the hell it is, it doesn't matter. If they can understand how to talk about that in the context of how and why, then it's no longer transactional and it's all about a guest experience. And when it's about a guest experience, your check average builds, they spend more money, more happily, they tip you better as a tipped employee and it's better for the operator. Right, that makes total sense. Uh, it almost like takes pressure off of the employee needing to learn in quotations all these things yeah. because it makes it more practical for them. 100%, yeah. and like, let's be real, like I, when I was a server, the only reason I'm a sommelier is because I was a server beforehand because I needed the money and it was very clear that the more I knew about wine, the more money I made. Right. But even then, and even now, I, I don't spend the time memorizing tasting notes. It's, useless i don't right. like i just the stuff that most people train on is not relevant to a service experience and it doesn't matter if you're a server and you can explain the subregions and the crews and all that if you do it in a way that doesn't in make the guests feel like you care about their experience and it doesn't make the guests feel comfortable and understood and excited and passionate so the knowledge isn't really as important as how you apply it so you talked a little bit about kind of price points and how they might be arranged and kind of how to navigate that on the list. I think that's another really big part. These guys are talking about, you know, and I've been thinking about, a lot about lately, you know, using the menu as a sales tool, right? It's something very important. Mm -hmm. You can't literally get to every interaction with somebody who has a wine menu in front of them. You're never gonna do it. Oh. We have an ample amount of sommeliers that work with us and I just know that we're probably at optimistically maybe 60, 40 of real interactions that we have to make a sale versus somebody just looking at the list and communicating what they want to somebody. Mm -hmm. So what have been, in that sense, maybe you know, maybe good menu organization or something that's been successful on how to place a product and on the menu properly so that somebody can make the best sale that's best for them and for the restaurant too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the first thing that people need to understand, if you're running a program, your menu is a sales tool. In theory, 99.9% .9 of the wine lists or food menus or drink menus that I see are not sales tools, they're documents of information. They should be a sales tool and it's about how you organize it. Um, and the, there is no one way to organize a list. It really depends on the concept, the size of the program, the scope of the program, but I can tell you this much. There are no rules in wine. You know, the only rule is whatever you like, you're correct, mm -hmm. right? But there's also another rule, 
never, ever, never, ever, never, <laughs> ever organize a list by price, ever. Why not? Well, I'll tell you why not. <laughs> if you organize a list by price, you are leaving on the table the opportunity for the guest to find something else that will connect and resonate with them. Um, and I, I, so I'm, I'm going to make up a scenario. Uh, what are you in the mood to drink right now? Anything. Um, what am I in the mood? Let's say Northern Rhone Syrah. Perfect. Okay. So I'm in a, uh, so hip okay. me. No, Northern Rhone Syrah is great. <laughs> right. Um, all right. So you want, so you want a Syrah. Cool. If you realize it or not, there is a price point. You might be conscious of it. You might be subconscious of it where a little neuron will fire in here and say, stop. Everybody has that price point for some people. It's lower for some people. It's higher. Mm -hmm. Some people know I, I want another Rhone Syrah sub a hundred dollars sub $200, sub 300, whatever. Not everybody knows consciously what it is. There's just a point where they stop looking. If I organize my list by price, let's say I only have eight Syrahs that fit what you want. If I organize them by price, and let's say your limit is $100, you're gonna look at the $62 one, the $79 one, the $98 one. Maybe you'll look at the $112 one and you're gonna stop there. But what if you looked a little further and you saw that I had some amazing Jamais Coat Roti that everywhere else is $299 and it's on my list and an older vintage for $160. Now that's way more than your sub $100 price point that you're gonna switch off at, mm -hmm. but you also know what an incredible deal that is and the value thing is gonna switch on and you're going to be compelled to wanna to get that wine. If I've organized it by price, you're not even gonna to get to see it. Right. Right? And it's not that you're hiding your inexpensive wines, and it's not that you're making it hard to find the inexpensive wines, but if the focus of the wine is the price point, the interaction with the guests, whether it's a sommelier or whether it's a server, is going to be based on the price instead of based on the experience. If you organize it some other way, you have so many more things to talk about. So let's, let's use this example, Northern Rhone. If I have my, or, my Northern Rhone section organized regionally, then I can start to talk to you about flavor profile differences. I can say, do you want something that's 100% Syrah, like Cornas, and maybe has a more olive you know, note behind it and, and a more savory edge? Or do you want to try Hermitage or Crows Hermitage, which has you know, Roussana Marsan mixed into it and gives it a little bit more fatness and richness of texture? Or do you want to talk about the coolness of how Viognier can co-ferment with Syrah and give you more extract in Cote Roti? And now we're all of a sudden talking about a whole bunch of interesting things that aren't price. So it might, and then, and whichever one you pick, we can then ratchet down and focus more. It can even be as simple as, okay, what are, what are the styles you're looking, or price point, or not price points, or what are the flavors that you're looking for, the style that you're looking for from there? I can say, okay, of these eight, these are the three that I think make the most sense. Then it's, then the conversation is not, which should I, which price point should I buy? It's what are the differences? And therefore you're gonna make your selection on that. I'll give you another example. Uh, by the glass, if, mm -hmm. let's say I always have at least two rosés by the glass, mm -hmm. uh, lower price point one and a higher price point one. Doesn't matter what those price points are, I always have two stylistically different rosés. So it's not about do I want the twelve dollar rosé or the sixteen dollar rosé. It's when a guest wants a rosé, I can say do you want a more berry toned one or a more citrus toned one, and whichever answer they give, I'll be like this is the one for you. So it's not about the price; it's about the guest experience. Right. But if you organize it by price, you are potentially leaving money on the table. Right. So that reminds me a little bit about what you guys were talking about, about P-mixes, um, and there's a lot that can be said about that. I was wondering if you could share, you know what I'm really curious about is some good habits. Like, what are some good habits that sommeliers who are responsible for their programs should have at looking at their P-mixes and how to respond to the information that they're getting from them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you're looking at your product mix, you have to understand that no matter if you have 10 wines or 10,000 wines, there will always be highest sellers and there will always be lowest sellers. So the whole idea of, oh, well, this wine barely sells is not a reason to not work with it. Right? There, no matter what it is, there will always be a lowest mover. That's just, that's just fact. Mm -hmm. The trick is to, to balance your menu mix so that your product mix of what's being purchased is anchored in the right way that financially benefits your restaurant. And when I say that, I don't mean like high markup things should sell more. That's not what I mean. What I'm saying is that you want to balance the steps and price points in the programs and you want to think about the contribution of individual items beyond percentage points. And I know you can't talk about revenue without talking about cost mm -hmm. because it's all ultimately a factor of gross profit. But I can't tell you how many times, even as like a, a, a veteran wine director running multi-million dollar programs, I had to straight up fight and argue with owners or executives or um, you know, sommeliers or wine directors that reported through me that you don't deposit percentage points in the bank and explain how it is if you have a menu where you, you know you're you're marked up at 30% or three times or whatever 
that's not necessarily as valuable than a wine that's a 60% cost of goods, but you'll sell it five times more often. And when you do, you put way more dollars in the bank. So you have so, to- Sorry to because that's, that's, yeah. I've been there too in that conversation. So I think, it, it, but in order to justify that to where you're running a higher percentage, you should also be able to show that we also had higher revenue this month. Well, I with, mean, Alongside yes. with that increase in, in percentage, right? Because if not, if you just had a higher percentage growth, then it doesn't mean that necessarily that you're bringing more revenue. Well, well yes and no. Uh, even if the revenue is equal, if you're putting more dollars in the bank as gross profit, that is more valuable than having a lower cost of goods as a percentage, mm -hmm. right? Because, uh, and, and I can't do the math exactly in my head, but, you know, play along at home. It is better for a program to sell a $90 bottle at 42% uh, cost of goods. We can do that math really quickly. I don't remember exactly what the dollars work out to. Then for them to sell a $70 bottle at 32% cost of goods. Right. If you do that math, the actual dollars, if you calculate the cost dollars versus the return, uh, and again, I'm not doing this very well in my head, but that night- There's a bigger margin. Right, you'll, make, yeah. you'll put 54 or $52 in the bank right. on the $90 bottle versus you'll put like $38 in the bank on the $60 bottle, even though the COGS percentage are better. So it's not about, it's not about um, having more top line revenue. That's also an important thing mm -hmm. is, is the way you organize your program to drive that revenue. Yeah. It's about understanding the relationship. Now, not just advocating for like everything on your list at 50% or 60% cost of goods, because then, you know, that's not profitably stable. So back to your point about product mix and menu mix is you have to balance the high cost of goods with low cost of goods things in a way that you're not gouging, you know, whether depending on the laws of your state, you know, mm -hmm. if you get volume deals, but really like you should have buy the glass wines that have very little competitive set. So you can take advantage of the discounts you get, charge a good price, make a great margin and those will drive it. And you know, you also have to think about the frequency, not just the contribution dollars, but the frequency. So uh, an example I like to use is um, I had uh, 1990 Latour uh, on the list. I think I paid like $890 a bottle for it or something. I don't remember exactly. And I was selling it for like $1,650. And they freaked out about the 60 something percent cost of goods. I'm like, okay, well, this is there for two reasons. Number one, I'm, it's not actually there to necessarily sell, but every time we sell a bottle, which I don't know, is like 10 times a year, pretty good. can't sell it if you don't have it. Right. So if we wouldn't have had that $1,600 bottle, the next most expensive bottle we had was $900. So right, right there, that's the gross revenue that it brings into your operation. Right. But even though it was terrible cost of goods, every time we sold it, we put, again, I'm not doing the math in my head right now, but we put like $750 into the bank. And you have to think about the higher cost of goods on that as a percentage meant a more appealing, more compelling purchase and an increased frequency. Right. So it's better to sell it at 60% cost of goods and put $750 in the bank 10 times a year than sell it at 35% cost of goods and put 1,000 or $1,100 in the bank three times a year. Right. So you have to think about gross revenue, the frequency of contribution, mm -hmm. the contribution margin, the profit dollars. Cost of goods is like a thing you have to consider, but it shouldn't be the be all and end all. Right. So one of the useful things about a PMIX is that it'll tell you kind of your average bottle price, right? And yeah. I think that's been a good barometer for, barometer for me in the past is like, okay, well, if I'm, my average bottle price is this and I want to increase revenue, I should be looking to way, at ways to increase that average bottle price. Is that correct? Is that one way to look at it? Um, that's certainly one way. Yeah. I mean, there's no correct or incorrect way to do it, but yeah. that is a very valuable metric to assess. What are some ways that you've looked at to increase revenue? I know it's a very kind of broad question, but within the scope of, you know, P mixes and numbers, like kind of looking at the data versus, you know, maybe organizing a menu a certain way, you know? Sure, well, I mean, there uh, ultimately when it comes to, what we're talking about is balancing your, mm -hmm. your menu. Um, there are three, I'll talk about balance and I'll talk about like sort of the three major components of, of menu management. So when it comes to balance, uh, I'll get, I'll use rosé as an example. Mm -hmm. If you were looking at your average, at your P-Mix and your average bottle sale of rosé, and you look at it that it's, I don't know, let's say it's $45. You can't just look at that in a vacuum. You have to look at the price dispersion of your rosé category. Rosé is a category where everybody's trying to tell you how inexpensive the rosé is and how much money you can make on it, but you know what the last thing I need is? Another sub $15 cost rosé that's gonna go on my list sub $50. Right. And so if you're saying my average my average uh, uh, bottle cost on rosé is $45, but nine of your 10 rosés are sub $50, well, so there is your problem, mm -hmm. right? It's about the, dis the dispersion of that category. So you have right. to go category by category, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, which is sort of the segue into the three critical aspects of a balanced beverage program. Uh, these are my terms. You can call them what you want. These are just things that I've made up through 
my own just you know years of doing this. I call these three factors steppers, compellers, and upper limit modifiers. And again, this is another reason we wouldn't organize by price. So a stepper is whether you have a 30 bottle program or a 300 or 3000 bottle program, within any category, there need to be logical steps. So let's go back to your Syrah. Let's, let's extract Northern Road and say, you just know you want a Syrah and you want to spend $80. Whether you tell me it's $80 or whether your hard limit in here is $80. If I have 10 Syrahs on the list and there's two under 80 and eight over 100, I don't have steps. If there's one in the 50s and one in the 70s and one is 90, 99 and there are 105 and the rest are into the twos and 300s, well, there's no steps for you to go. You're going to get the you know the $70 one or the $50 one and that's it. Right. But if I had 10 Syrahs and there was one at 52 and one at 70 and one at 87 or 88 or 86, that's an easy step to mm -hmm. go. And even though your limit's 80, we can train our teams to say something. You know, If, if you say, let's say, oh, my hard limit's 80, I want a Syrah, you'd be like, Okay, we'll talk about flavor profile, and you'll tell me what you want. I'll be like, okay, well, I, you know, I have a couple options for you. I also want to point out this wine uh, because it is absolutely extraordinary, exactly what you're asking for. And you know, it, at that price point, you can say something effective for the difference of you know about two dollars a glass. It becomes a, it, this is the wine for you. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, it's not about it's eight dollars more. It's two dollars a glass more. Well, who cares? Who wouldn't spend two dollars right. a glass more? And here's the beauty of this. Now that you're talking about the $88 wine, you can then continue to say, and in that same neighborhood, and talk about the $100 wine. It's not that you're just trying to sell them on it, it's that you're making these recommendations based on, uh, first of all, a conversation with them about what they want, but you have the steps for them to go. Mm -hmm. So you're not trying to take them from 80 to 120, but you can take them from 80 to 88, and while you're already talking about 88, it's an easy step to the, to the mid, uh, to upper 90s or low 100s. So, steppers, key. And that, and that doesn't matter if you have, you know, Again, 30 wines or 3,000 wines, whatever the category is. If you have 30 wines, it's then you need to have red wines, fuller body red wines. If you have five full bodied red wines, they need to step that price. Five lighter red wines, they need to do those price steps. So it doesn't matter how granular your program is, you've got to do those, those steppers. Yeah. The next thing are compellers. And again, it's another reason not to organize by price. That Jamais we talked about, that's even though 160 is twice what you're going to spend, you know that should be $300. And you know that in the competitive set of the restaurant, everywhere else it's $300. You're like, I am compelled to get this because it's such a great price. Or maybe you visited the Northern Rhone and I have something on the list that was from a winery that you visited. And suddenly you're like, oh, Jaboulet, hell yeah, I loved being there. It was such a great experience. And then that will take you take you to that, especially because it's a compelling price. A, again, a reason not to organize by price point because mm -hmm. you would have never seen it. B, it's a compulsion to want to support that thing right. for reasons other than price point. Lastly is the upper limit modifier. And I sort of talked about that a little bit. A, you can't sell it if you don't have it. But B, the best way to sell a $200 bottle of wine is put it next to a $400 bottle. The best way to sell a $400 bottle, put it next to a $700 bottle. Want to sell $1,000 bottles of wine? Have a couple of $1,400 and $1,600 bottles on the list. It's, it's a psychological experiment I've run, in, like in actual time in restaurants. Um, I hate reserve lists for other reasons of psychology that I think suck, like embarrassing your guests or making somebody feel awkward in the wrong way or putting right. someone on the spot. Well, maybe that's time for another another film. But um, I did the experiment with the reserve list uh, at one of the restaurants I was managing, and uh, our most expensive Bordeaux and Burgundies were around $400, and our average bottle off of the reserve list when assessing that P-mix was two to 300. Mm -hmm. Then I put a bunch of six and $700 bottles on, and suddenly the average moved up to 350. Yeah. I put a bunch of eight and $900 bottles on, and suddenly the average moved up to the fours and fives, put a, a $1,600 bottle on, and suddenly we're selling eight and $900 bottles of wine. Now, that was about assessing the P-mix, right. giving the steps. Those weren't even necessarily compellers. They were giving the steps and having that upper limit modifier so that the person who was spending $600 wasn't feeling like, oh, they're just selling me the most expensive bottle right. because there was a $900 bottle next to it. Right. No, there's, is, there's proven psychology to yeah. that. Okay, Eric, we have to wrap up here. Um, what are some things that sommeliers need to walk away from by hearing this interview? Um, First and foremost, I know it doesn't seem really sexy to talk about product mix and and looking at programming and and editing menus and all that stuff and, and the business and operations of it, but trust me when I tell you it's far more sexy to be good at that than to be able to list the Grand Cru's of champagne alphabetically backwards. Job security. It, it, it's not, yeah, you make yourself <laughs> invaluable. Yes. I mean, if you think about it, when you are running a beverage program, you, though it's not, for most restaurants or operations, it is not the largest portion of revenue. It certainly is the largest portion of profitability, especially if you're doing it well. So you make mm -hmm. yourself invaluable, and that's how you continue on your pr career progression, especially if eventually you want to skip the whole 16-hour days, six days a week, and working nights and weekends and holidays and get into a position where you can maybe work from, your, from a computer or from your house. Mm -hmm. If you're not really good with this finance and operations, you're never going to get there. So right. as in terms of like, 
make a succession plan for your career, that's important. Um, but ultimately, just get used to numbers. You can't just ignore math because you don't like it. You can't just ignore uh, these, these tactics for balancing a program and building revenue. So like if I were to summarize, like the most important things for managing revenue, your menu is a sales tool. Mm -hmm. In all categories, however f small or large there are, have steppers, compellers, and upper limit modif modifiers. Learn how to train your staff on how and why, not just what. And uh, understand your guests and understand your customers, and your customers are your employees. Understand what they need to make more money, what they need to boost their check average and their tip percentage, because if you can give them that information that they can easily express to your guests, then your team makes more money, your operation makes more money, you probably make more money, whether yeah. you're commissioned or bonused or whatever, yeah. and, it, and, it all, and it all comes around. I love so, that one. So yeah. ju just, just remember that it's not just about, I know a lot about this wine, I've been to this region, I love these wines, I'm going to put them on the list. That's important too. I suppose the last thing I'd say is make sure your list fits the ethos of your, of your operation. It cannot be a record collection of your favorite songs. Sure, put your own stamp on it, have the esoteric stuff, have you know the Cuervi Age Ricazzatelli from Georgia. By all means, have that. But it can't be, like I said, a record collection of your greatest hits. Your wine program, big or small, should be a fully mastered soundtrack that perfectly fits the film that is your restaurant. Mm, I love that. Hey man, thank you so much for your time. Always I appreciate pleasure. you. Thank you. Um, if people want to hear more or get in touch with you, how can they get in touch with you? Um, so um, there are a couple different ways. Uh, the website is being built. So the sommelier, S-O-M-L-Y-A-Y.com. It's not alive yet, but it will be nice, soon. Nice, nice. Um, Good handle. Um, the hashtag sommelier, S-O-M-L-Y-A-Y, is all of the posts are mine except one. So you can find me there. Uh, Instagram, uh, at Eric4Wine, E-R-I-K, e -R -I -K, the number four. And if you cannot spell wine, we're not going to be friends anyway. Uh, <laughs> Um, um, LinkedIn, Facebook. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. L look for a guy in a bow tie at a wine event. I love it. <laughs> You're amazing, man. Awesome. My man. Hey, thank guys, you. thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Hospitality TV. Please make sure to follow Eric. Um, he's killing the game. You guys need to keep up with it. Um, and don't forget to follow and subscribe to the Hospitality TV podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Also, at Hospitality TV on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. See you later.